Our speaker, he has more than 18 years of experience in network security industry. His area of focus includes authentication, threat intelligence, denial of service, and malware analysis. Please give a warm welcome to the Senior Director, Consulting System Engineering at Fortinet, Cash Balji. Right. Good morning, everybody. Yes, it's just about morning. That is me. I'm not the father of that person. I don't know uh, <laughs> why marketing. I don't insist that marketing use these pictures. Victoria's at the back, so if you want to actually uh, complain about you know quality assurance and the product not actually matching the advertising, it's not down to me. It's down to marketing. So yeah, it's uh, me and then the break. So bear with me. So hopefully there'll be no early walkouts, but. Um, a really good couple of presentations, so thank you for having us today um, at your event. But I think, yeah, Brian's uh, presentation perfectly kind of lines me up for my talk today. So I'm Cash, I'm from Fortinet. I've been there too long, far too long to, for me to honestly admit uh, my tenure there. But I'll be talking about SecOps and um, SecOps within the context of the SOC. So this is the, I'll get past the scary bit first. So, you know, this is the bit where normally the vendor says, oh, it's getting worse, it's getting bad. Um, but actually, there was, I didn't actually see Brian's slides prior to submitting my presentation, but it's kind of like a perfect kind of build-up. So uh, the presentation really today is focused around what's concerning our customers most when we go and speak to them, and it is exposure. It is the, um, the expansion of the attack surface and how customers, partners, ourselves actually manage with, first of all, quantifying and identifying the scope of the attack surface, and then what you actually then need to address that. Um, so, you know, no longer is a best of breed, well, it's always tricky to say, well, you don't need best of breed. Of course you need best of breed. But what we're actually finding is that a unified platform that works together is far more effective and has a much more high rate of efficacy than, you know, trying to actually look for point products that solve point problems. So I'll, I'll, I'll intentionally cut down on the number of slides where we scare you and say, look, this is you know, the, the really bad stuff that's happening out there. I think, um, not that I'm an academic, you can probably tell by my muted North London accent that I'm not, but Oscar Wilde said, um, I think it was in the late 1800s, when I wasn't at school, it was, I went to school just after the late eight, uh, 1800s, that uh, life imitates art a lot more than art imitates life. So I don't trip myself up here because I'm not academic. But the premise of that statement, uh, it was, I think it was in an essay in The Decay of Lying, was that in life, you know, we're quite, we have to follow processes, you know, there's rigidities, there's structures, whereas in art, there's freedom of expression. Um, I'm probably getting out of my depth here, but in a, and in that freedom of expression, we, we get to express ourselves. So if that's what we were doing in the late, relying on art in the late 1800s, just pre-1900s, you know, to express ourselves, if we kind of fast forward a century and a bit more, if you look at what digitization's allowed us to do in regards to expression, um, how we can express ourselves, how we can shoot ourselves in the foot as well. Um, that really then kind of is all the scaring bit that I need to do. You know, the, the, both professionally and personally, the, the access that we have to digital exposure is, you know, so much more vast and infinite than we ever had before. And it's the quantification of that, which is um, really what my presentation is about. How do you actually then try to quantify, contain that kind of uh, exposure, that threat, um, and build the best platform to actually cover it. So it's, it's good, there's a lot of AI. Um, I've, wor I've worked in threat intelligence within Fortinet for a decade. It's just an interesting thing, so my talk's not on AI, but um, one of the interesting things that we've seen well, that our researchers have brought up recently is there's a huge market on the dark web for chat GPT accounts. So you think it's a bit strange, right, because they're, they're free to sign up, certainly with the entry level. Um, uh, with well, the basic account for ChatGPT, we can, you can use chat, I think, the third gen. Uh, they're free accounts, so you can spin up loads of fake accounts, uh, as many as you want. So it was actually puzzling us momentarily why, you know, you'd want, why there is such a big, and it grew. I actually mentioned this last year at one of my talks, but we've actually seen that market increase. Um, so there is a fully established market on the dark web now for ChatGPT accounts. And the reason for that, going back to this, you know, digital self-expression, is that you know, we're asking so personal questions, both personally and professionally, into these LLM platforms that someone that's actually got a targeted interest in yourself or your organization no longer needs to kind of uh, target your social media accounts. If they go to your, if they can compromise or gain access to 
a dumped credential or leaked credential of your, uh, you know, your LLM accounts, your uh, ChatGPT accounts, we're asking such personal and pertinent and relevant questions to our lives that it exposes so much information that it's very valuable in the hands of the uh, adversaries and the threat actors. So it's an interesting thing. But, I mean, for me personally, um, you know, I've, I've always believed you don't need AI to digitally self-destruct. I've been digitally self-destructing from my teenage years. From when my parents found, first found my internet search history, that was my um, very painful day, uh, digital <laughs> self-destruction. Uh, I fast forward 30 years, not a lot's changed. Now my wife picks up my phone and she, she doesn't even have to go to the search history. She just looks at my messages and my WhatsApp messages and everything's in place from there. Um, but yeah, no, all joking aside, um, I'll get on with it. But yeah, I mean, certainly AI threat intelligence, we're here, 14 are upstairs, there's Malcolm, Rebecca, and Vicky. This is something that we've worked on for a very long time. So, SOC. Um, so this one was a bit of a weird one. So SOC, even though there's a unified definition, um, when we're speaking spe specifically to customers, it can mean different things. Sometimes when we're speaking to an organization, they say, well, actually, that's not a responsibility, or we've got network security, and then there's advanced threats, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what I've learned to kind of do is, you know, instead of actually talking specifically about SOX, if we look at that bit in the middle, that green square in the middle, is actually your cyber defense strategy, or your cyber defense kind of resilience, as our country manager likes to call it, then it goes from being a, you know, a discussion around a SOC, which is relevant to an, you know, a large organization, uh, to an organization that's potentially you know, a two-person, non-for-profit, all the way up to 500,000 endpoints. When we're talking, when we change the word SOC to cyber defense or cyber defense strategy, it all of a sudden becomes relevant to almost everybody that has any type of digital footprint. So that bit in the middle, if that's us as a vendor, in, you know, Integrity 360 as a partner, you guys as their customers, our customers, um, you know, what are the things that you actually, when you're building this framework in regards to security operations, need to kind of consume? So on, the, on your left-hand side coming in, we have Threat Intel. So a few years ago, Threat Intel was kind of a nice to have. Um, most organizations had it, certainly, you know, the MSSP or the, uh, the partners that spe uh, specialized in Threat Intel. Um, that was something that was kind of a nice to have with them. We're actually finding that that's kind of imperative now. Um, so Threat Intel Environmental Data, I'll hold it there actually. So Threat Intel Environmental Data, that's what goes into the SOC. Um, and then based on what the SOC or the Cyber Defense Strategy actually then you know, does with that information, then they take the appropriate response from that. So I think I'm not explaining it too well, but if we kind of look at the, again, if you imagine the middle bit here as being your cyber defenses, in essence, this is a very high level of what they do. They receive the information, the relevant business from the business, and then they take the appropriate response. That's it, okay? Um, it's already been mentioned, um, you know, in regards to Dora, in regards to NIST, no longer when you're building your cyber defenses, is it okay just to have a, you know, a specific um, product that caters for a specific requirement? There now has to be kind of be this telemetry, there has to be uh, like a platform where and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be from one vendor. You know, as much as all the vendors that are here today would like you to consume you know, as many of their products as possible, this is where partners, specialist partners uh, like Integrity360 work very well with the vendors in that the way uh, the end users, the customers ultimately consume it is really kind of what's best for them. But more so now than ever before, when you're putting that platform together, we find that the... Um, compliance is actually driving a huge part of that. So it used to be finance. You know, finance were always kind of heavily regulated, finance and public sector. But now with, um, with so much regulation, it's kind of top of board and it's always incredible to, you know, uh, find money from your senior management team when uh, compliance discussions come into fruition. So, you know, there can be no budget, there's a headcount freeze. As soon as a, there's a kind of compliance concern or the auditors around the corner, you know, the, the, suddenly the coffers open up and the, uh, the budgets become a lot more readily available. All right, so now to get, actually get to the main part of the presentation. So going back to, you know, if I said, if you consider the green boxes or the, certainly the bit in the middle is your cyber defense strategy. This is your cyber defense, your digital defense of your organization. What does that have to take into consideration? It needs to take into consideration threat intel, environmental data, it consumes that information and then it takes a response. And then that can be yourself as an organization, that can be yourself working with partners such as Integrity360. So, 
your, your typical kind of platforms, your firewalls, your IPS, your EPP, uh, your cloud protection, that's kind of the front line. So if you're talking about digital defenses, that's your traditional front line. Um, it's not to underplay you know, the, the, the role and the job that they do, but that, if that's the typical front line, we'll then map the technologies or the technology stacks that then fit onto the green boxes. So the first thing, and this again goes on very well, uh, follows on very well nicely from what Brian was saying, you know, in regards to exposure um, and just threats and adversaries in general, what we're finding is most organizations, you know, that job in itself is too large for an organization to undertake by themselves. So that's in regards to threat intel and contextualized threat intel. So, and you know, we, we all don't admit it, but after the pandemic, and you know, the pandemic was kind of not, obviously it was, it was something uh, that we've all been through globally together, but nothing's really gone right, gone back to normal and to that same groove you know, after the pandemic. It could be just me. I used to think it was me, so I was just keeping it quiet, but the more people I kind of speak to, um, you know, the, uh, the way we work, our timing, just keeping up to date with the schedule, you know, 24 hours not being enough in the day, this is common stuff. So it's good, it was reassuring to know that I wasn't having a nervous breakdown and other people were experiencing it as well. But when we map that into, you know, digital defenses, if you're overloaded, uh, which you definitely are, you know, we, we can say that ourselves as a vendor, if you're overloaded, you're understaffed because there's a skill shortage, the actual, you know, the, the reconnaissance bit, the dark web monitoring, you know, who's, and I'm not talking about the vulnerability scanning. I'm talking about, you know, uh, looking out for your, uh, your brand protection, your social media monitoring, uh, phishing websites, what the adversaries are talking about, your organization or your peer organizations on the dark web. You know, that's a responsibility we're finding that most organizations can't undertake themselves, and that's being offloaded. And for us, we have a product called 40 Recon, but again, this is something that we work very closely with our partners with. And so that, that digital monitoring of your organization, that is something that's being offloaded. For me personally, in my team, I have a team that kind of spans, that does threat intelligence, and we cover Amir and APAC for Fortinet. Um, that for us is our kind of number one product at the moment. The, the digital kind of risk assessment and monitoring of organizations. Um, you know, even a lot of the discussions on the dark web, uh, a lot of these forums, you have to have a certain amount of bad kudos to actually inter you know, engage with these uh, adversaries and threat actors. And again, this is something most organizations don't have. So this is something that our partners and solutions like um, 40 Recon can actually undertake for you. And it's a pure SaaS. So there's no software, there's no agents, there's nothing to install. It is monitoring your organization out as a digital asset on the dark web, you know, on the internet or whatever, um, and undertaking that task for you. So some, I'm not normally a huge fan of Gartner because I've just been in the industry obviously way too long, but they have coined a term recently which I really like, which is EDP, which is Early Detection Prevention. Um, and that, you know, if we're talking about SecOps, we're talking about you know, digital defenses, the concept of EDP uh, I really like because that, you know, just as we say this digital risk and monitoring and protection is sometimes too great a task for most organizations to undertake, so you offload off that. So, um, we find that true for something like EDP as well. So EDP technology, um, for me, it is Sandbox, uh, EDR, and NDR. And what that basically is, the EDP technology, is a threat analyst in a virtual format. So that can be either with an on-premise solution, a cloud-based solution, and it's typically you know, something that we offer in conjunction with our partners. So it's not necessarily something that we say, you know, this is directly from Fortinet, but each one of those products, of what a sandbox, what an EDR, what an NDR does is, in essence, analyzing, doing deep analysis of the metadata on your network. So with a sandbox, what's happening, and with any sandbox, it doesn't have to be 40 sandbox, what you're actually saying, a sandbox is saying, look, give me loads of files, and I'll, I'll deep analyze them for you. So with the majority of uh, files that you give to a sandbox, 99.999999% of them are clean. So all the, the PDFs, the PowerPoints, the EXEs, the spreadsheets that we throw into the sandbox, the majority of the time they're clean. Uh, but we want that level of surety and that absolute knowledge that they are clean. So um, you know, we use a sandbox to do that. And you wouldn't want a threat analyst to sit there for hours and hours a day in a week and a month to deep analyze files that are potentially clean. So a sandbox offloads that responsibility for you. you know, it's that virtual analyst that actually says, look, I'll analyze all the files, just give the files to me. 
Now, in some environments, it's not possible to give a sandbox a file. It could be the latency, it could be the geographic spread of the network. Sometimes it's not possible to give the sandbox a file. So with EDR technology, we say, listen, we'll take that virtual security analyst and we'll embed it into the kernel level of your operating system. So instead of actually gathering the files across the network or picking them up in sniffer mode and sending them to a sandbox, we will go right into the operating system, at the heart of the operating system, and scan those files as a threat analyst in real time at the kernel level. And obviously, with OT, with so many, uh, you know, such a wide plethora of operating systems out there, sometimes it's not possible to actually insert the uh, EDR technology into the um, uh, operating system. So with NDR, we said, well, look, if, we, if you can't give us the files, if we can't hook into your operating system, stick us on the side of the network, um, and then we will actually do that same level of analysis on the side of the network. And obviously, we, you know, we're talking potentially about encrypted traffic, but you know, when you're using um, uh, metadata extraction with uh, protocols such as Zeek, you know, then they really cater for encrypted traffic quite well. So the whole, for me, EDP nowadays is almost like EDP is the solution. The sandbox, the EDR, or the NDR is the actual delivery mechanism for that solution. We're actually saying, look, we're gonna do the threat analysis for you. Um, or, you know, and, and it doesn't, I mean, obviously, it'd be great if it's 40, but it's, these technologies do the threat analysis for you but it's where you actually insert those technologies um, is then uh, the, the flavor of the platform that you uh, implement. So that's the EDP. Now, when it comes to SecOps, uh, a lot of the industry is actually referring, uh, you know, talking about, uh, or certainly starting their SecOps story from this bit here. So SIM, XDR, 40 Analyzer, for us, that's kind of like data lake technology. So it's, um, it's good, data lakes are good uh, until they get expensive, right? So that's, I know, something that you're all struggling with is your data lake cost. It's a wonderful concept. Keep sending me your logs into this massive central repository, not just your security logs, but your network events, your endpoint events, send me everything. So tip, uh, technologies such as SIM, XDR, and 40 Analyzer, which is a turnkey solution for us, they are, you know, in essence, data lake technology. And the SAW normally is like the top layer. So if you have your data lake, the SAW is what kind of scans the data lake or is certainly prompted by the data lake to then uh, send out the automated responses. And again, data lake technology is relatively easy to get into, really expensive to kind of maintain, and you know, operationally quite tough to manage. And again, this is something that we're looking at uh, organizations that are offloading to us, um, and 40 Guard offer MDR incident response type services, but absolutely, you know, our model is, we, we follow a strict channel model. Uh, Fortinet as an organization, you know, we're pretty big. Uh, so we certainly can't, I mean, we will never know uh, a customer's two requirement, uh, true requirements to the extent someone like Integrity 360 would. So you now we actually partner with our partners um, to actually offer these services, and that is our go-to kind of market, is to work with our partners in delivering um, incident response and MDR services. It's certainly something that we don't kind of actively, you know, promote ourselves directly. Um, but they, you know, that, in essence, when you're looking at data lake technology, when you're looking at automated responses, these are the type of partnerships if you can't undertake that kind of skill set or that technology stack within your organization that you rely on. And again, like I said, it wasn't a setup between myself and Brian. Actually, I don't think I've met Brian before today. Um, so continuous threat management. So irrespective of where you're implementing these technology stacks, quite often an organization will say to us that, okay, look, this is good. We're actually doing this, but somebody's doing this for us. Um, we're finding that you know, continuous threat management, irrespective of if you're working with a partner, is something that you can undertake yourself. So things like deception technology are very easy to implement. You know, they're, non, they're not in line, they sit on the side of the network, and with something like 40 Deceptor as an example, um, you know, we can spin up fake virtual, or what we call decoys, fake operating systems, Linux, Windows, um, you know, uh, virtual Macs, um, CCTV printers, cameras, even fake 40 gates, um, and a really interesting concept that we have at the moment when we're talking about uh, you know, attack surface management and exposure management is whenever there's a brand new, like what we call an outbreak, we intentionally, so a brand new vulnerability, so not vendor bashing, you know, as a vendor, especially with all the SSL vulnerabilities at the moment, you, you, know, you can't live in a glass house and throw big boulders at other people's glass houses, so definitely not throwing a, a, a boulder or a rock towards Avanti, but you know, those poor buggers got hit quite bad. Um, so we saw the, uh, you know, a lot of our own customers panic. So one of the things that we do is whenever there's like an emerging threat, 
We actually then, you know, we, we publish a whole bunch of public articles, you know, in regards to which Fortinet products can protect you, and, you know, the, all the public references as well. But in that panic, because I have this panic as well, because when we're working, I work with the threat intelligence team, and whenever there's an, like an emerging threat, you know, the, the, the upper floors get quite heavy in regards to, you know, what's the exposure, are we exposed, what's the customer exposure like, and trying to provide that information in a timely manner especially when there's so much fake news, especially when there's so much dodgy stuff happening on the forums, it's quite challenging. So one of the things that we actually, based on customer feedback, do with 40 Deceptor, uh, if there's a brand new vulnerability that's kind of breaking out across the world, we intentionally you know, uh, release that. So we, we do all the curation, we, we find the vulnerability, we test it, and we actually then release that. We automatically update one of our fake decoys to publish that vulnerability. So it sounds crazy. But we intentionally, you know, we've done, we do the work for you, and so look, here's the vulnerability. If you really want to say to your senior management staff that we're not exposed, you can actually say, well, I've got hold of the vulnerability, I've exposed it in a certain part of my network, and we're not seeing any hits on that. Okay? So this is just one of the ways. There's loads of ways, but, you know, I really like the concept. There's another word, I've forgotten it already, that Brian had, but, you know, continuous threat management. This is something not necessarily that you have to work with a large organization. This is something at any level that can be achieved, you know, from a customer, from a partner, from a vendor point of view. And again, what we find is a lot of customers kind of like this concept. Um, they want to, you know, potentially start heading in this direction. Uh, if they simply can't, then, you know, we have the, and our partners offer the SOC as a service, which in essence is, look, send us the logs. You know, we'll act as your data lake to begin with because it's the easiest way to implement this technology stacks without actually having to implement them. You know, give us your data, you know, we'll kind of provide that data lake and then provide the MDR and the incident response services from there. But certainly, you know, the easiest entry points quite often, when I do this presentation, I'm asked a lot, you know, how do you actually start? I, I like the concept of EDP, you know, that virtual security analyst, you know, that deep metadata analysis. I like the fact that 40 net or another vendor or our partner can do that for us, but that obviously means actually implementing technology getting live into the technology stacks. Um, you know, if, I, if I'm not ready to take that big a jump, you know, what's the easiest entry points? Then certainly something like the digital risk protection solution like uh, 40 Recon, or the SOC as a service where there's no software, there's no agents to install. You certainly put on, you just point your logs in one direction and we do that work for you. Or obviously with our partners. So one thing I'd like to just kind of finish up, um, I'm actually finished ahead of time, which is quite incredible. Um, is everything that we do in regards to advanced threats is underpinned by open standards. So the MITRE attack framework, uh, uh, MITRE engage, which is heavily based on uh, deception technology, uh, everything that we do is underpinned by open standards, so anything that we log goes straight into there, so it's like homogenous logging. Um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of the other cybersecurity vendors that you work with as well uh, support these standards, which is wonderful, you know, because at last, after many years, uh, you can go onto a console and irrespective of the vendor technology underneath that kind of management or logging console, the, the output and the mapping you know, of the threats is universal. Um, and the other thing is obviously um, Stix Taxi, which has been around for a long time, but in, in environments where open standards frameworks aren't applicable, then pretty much less all our advanced threat products have got uh, open APIs, both inbound and outbound. So you can push information in, you can extract information out. Uh, a lot of vendors, uh, a lot of customers that we work with quite often say, um, you know, we, we have our central management, we have our data lake type technology, but we like what you're doing in this environment. So what you can then do, instead of introducing another GUI, another management platform onto the network, is just extract whatever we're doing with the APIs and push it into whatever you have there today. Okay? So I won't finish up on this slide. Uh, because you have a copy of these slides, I kind of left it in there. This is the last one. So I try to avoid the word journey. It's a bit... I mean, if anyone else is using it in the presentation, it's not cheesy, just for me personally. You know, I find it slightly overused words, so if someone does talk about cybersecurity journeys, I actually find cybersecurity maturity levels is a more relevant term for me nowadays anyway. Like I said, if anyone else is using the word journey in their presentation, it's not a reflection, and I'm tying myself up a bit, but me. So, you know, cybersecurity maturity levels, I think this is a good way to kind of look at where we, or your organization is today. Um, you know, starting at the basic you know, uh, access control, uh, ma malware, anti-malware protection, going all the way up to, you know, data lakes and then kind of your platform approach, which is the, the, at the end. And, you know, like I said, to kind of go full circle on how I started the presentation with the platform approach, what we're really hoping to achieve with our customers is to give you that kind of framework that, be it SOC or your digital defenses or your cyber defense strategy, can sit within. And, 
in Locust City. You'll have a copy of the slides. Um, we have a stand up there, so feel free to come and speak to us. But we're actually demoing a lot of the technology in the slides. You know, irrespective of whatever the blue boxes were in your technology stack, you know, your platform should be able to interoperate. Uh, and like I said, this is something that we really place a lot of emphasis on, is the you know, interoperability between our products and third parties as well. All right, that's quite a few words per minute. So you probably don't need the coffee now, uh, the coffee break, but I think that does lead into the coffee break. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm here for the rest of the day. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Cash. Thank you so much. And just as Cash, you did my job. It's time for coffee break. You can find Cash and his team at 